Welcome to the Leadership Hour. I am Steve Adubato. Listen, I like to call myself a leadership guru, but that's that's ridiculous. It's self-serving. Well, you do like to call yourself that. I mean, all of a sudden this voice comes in. That's Mary Gamba, who is the real leadership guru, or at least she's the leader of her own home and our company. Yes. And we all just work for Mary. No, yes, that is true. So this is the Leadership Hour. Every week what we do is we deal with a whole range of leadership topics. We also deal with communication management as well. But it's all under the umbrella of leadership. And before we talk to our great friend, Dennis Wilson, who is the president and CEO of Delta Dental of New Jersey and Connecticut, Mary, let folks know how they can check out Absolutely. Leadership Hour. Well, and one thing that I do want to make sure that we press pause and say thank you to our friends at AM970, Jerry Crowley, all those great people over there. Uh, it's a pleasure working with them, airing there every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And if you are listening to us on the radio right now, you can also subscribe to our other podcasts on Apple iTunes and Google Play. You can give us a good rating, of course, if you like what you hear and you will. And you could also follow us on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D., that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, and on Twitter, Steve Adubato. And also we have tips, tools, leadership columns, all for free on our website at stand-deliver.com. Well said, Mary. By the way, we'll thank our clients at Stand Deliver, folks at and New Jersey Resources, RWJ Barnabas Health, Gibbons, the Sharing Network, et cetera, et cetera. We'll thank them later. Absolutely. But right now. By popular demand, we go to our good friend Dennis Wilson, who is the president and chief executive officer of Delta Dental, New Jersey and Connecticut. How are you doing, my friend, Dennis? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you. And thanks for having me on. It's great having you. By the way, I was out with Dennis at the annual Delta Dental golf outing. We were playing together. And let's just say that we were the best golfers, but we didn't want to show everyone up. So we didn't bring our A game. So while Dennis and I were playing, tell folks where all the proceeds of that outing go to and why that's so important, which is a big part of leadership, Dennis. Yeah, Steve, thank you for that. For the last 29 years, next year will be our 30th year, our signature fundraiser is a golf outing with 100% of the net proceeds going to Special Olympics in New Jersey. And it's just a great cause. We're also a lead sponsor for they're winter games, so we fund Special Olympics athletes so they can participate at no cost to them. It's just a great way to give back to the community. That's awesome, and I'm proud every year to be the MC of that event and be there with Dennis and Randy Stoddard and the great team at Delta Dental. By the way, Mary, you'll appreciate that the Devils, hmm. your hockey team. And Kenny Danico. Kenny Ken, was there, right? Ken, Kenny was there, right? By the way, real quick, I swear we're going to get into leadership topics, but real quick, Dennis, the connection between the Devils and Delta Dental is? We have a partnership with the Devils. When you go to The Rock, you'll see green all over. We are one of the lead sponsors of the New Jersey Devils. You'll see our signage. You'll see us up on the smile cam. You'll see the folks that clear the ice in Delta Dental green with Delta Dental shovels and the fan bony, which uh, <laughs> brings people around the ice during breaks, is Delta Dental all over. So we're really happy with the Devils partnership. They've been a terrific player with us. Mary, you've seen that, haven't you? Oh, gosh, yeah, the fan bony. <laughs> I haven't seen you on it, though, Dennis, so uh, you'll have I to have let me know. Been, I have been he on has. it. I no like way. A yes, I know he has. Fan bony. You yes, have got to be kidding to, me. for another ride. We go to a lot of Devils games, as many as we can. Uh, my boys both play for the New Jersey Youth Devils, oh. so they practice out of that facility as well. So they get to run in, and I'll tell you, it's a class act. They run into the players all the time because they're also practicing You know what, Mary, there, let's so. get the uh, president and general manager of the Devils. Mm -hmm. uh, That's a great idea. We've had idea. him on the broadcast, on the TV side. Mm -hmm. Let's have him. Absolutely. Um, Dennis, uh, let's jump right into this. So this is Dennis Wilson, president and CEO of Delta Dental, New Jersey and Connecticut. We should also disclose that Delta Dental is one of the major underwriters of the PBS and the Fios work that we do on the TV side. So first of all, Dennis is one of the nicest, even-keeled people I've ever met, does not seem to have a temper. <laughs> Basically, what, Mary, okay, I, Mary, Mary. Come on, you knew you were going there. Don't even okay, tell Okay, Dennis, me. I'm not going to make it about me, but she's looking at me like, wow, all the things you're not, Steve. So, um, <laughs> Dennis, we your leadership. We each other, Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah the yeah, yin yeah, and yes. the yang. Dennis, here's the question. How and where did you develop your leadership style? You know, that's an interesting question because, you know, there's a school of thought that, Great leaders are born, not made. And then there's an opposing 
opinion that great leaders are made, not born. And I'm of the latter school of thought. I think leadership, and I'm just speaking for me right now, starts at a real young age and it starts at home. It starts with your parents instilling great values like work ethic, value for education, and just persevering regardless of how tough times can be. I started in my career, I was, I'll call it very fortunate, worked hard, was CEO of a small company at the age of 27. Really? uh, Surrounded by a lot of folks that knew a lot more. And what I did was be humble. You know, I was always eager to learn, quick to take the advice of folks I respected that have fought the battles before and surrounded myself with just a terrific A team. So that's the way I look at it. I'm curious about this. I thought I knew about Dennis. At 27, you're a CEO. To what degree did you say to yourself at 27, wow, quote, I'm out of my league? Probably day one. (laughs) (laughs) And how'd you deal with that? I quickly realized that, hey, I'm fortunate to have it. Obviously, I was respected enough and, you know, worked collegially and cooperatively enough with the board of directors at that time, which, by the way, was a investment banking firm. So I knew I had at least the persona, the credibility, and was willing and able to take guidance and direction. You know, and I think that's really the key, particularly for any young leader. We don't know it all. We will never know it all. And I think for us to realize that, for me to realize that at a very young age and to take guidance, advice, direction, and just good counsel from folks that were on the board, colleagues that I work with, mentors and others was just really, really key to that success because that could have crashed and burned at any moment if I had not done that. You're listening to uh, Dennis Wilson, president and CEO of Delta Dental in New Jersey and Connecticut. It's interesting, Dennis, you talked about it was an investment firm, but now you lead Delta Dental, and I was remiss. I want to make sure people know what Delta Dental is. Could you give people a sense of exactly what it is? And and I would say it's different from an investment firm. It is very different from an investment firm, quite frankly. Delta Dental of New Jersey is part of the Delta Dental system. We are a dental benefits, oral health, and wellness company. We operate in New Jersey and Connecticut, but the Delta franchise, if you will, operates in all 50 states. We lead market share in Fortune 1000 companies. In New Jersey, we also have a majority of the school board market and public sector market, as well as offer dental benefit coverage to employers, large and small, as well as to individuals in both our states. Got it. New Jersey and Connecticut. Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba. This is the Leadership Hour on AM 970 and also our podcast. So it's interesting. Dennis and I, while we were playing in the Delta Dental outing benefiting Special Olympics of New Jersey, we should have been talking about our putting game or the way we were hitting the ball off the tee or sand traps that you get into on almost every hole. But I wound up talking to Dennis a little bit about relationship building. We were talking about what it takes to establish relationships, keep relationships, others who usurp those relationships by undercutting us with price or whatever it is. So here's what I'm curious about, Dennis. Leadership and relationship building. Describe the connection. Hand in glove, Steve, without a doubt. New Jersey, 8.5 or so million people, is the smallest state I know with that dense of population. It is incredible how many folks, particularly when you ascend to the senior management, CEO level, how small this state actually is. So relationships are key from the inside looking out. In other words, we value our relationship with our customers with our key brokers, with our consultants, with the other boards that I'm on. And it's a really small state when you boil it down to it. And that's why I think relationships should be cherished, quite frankly, and utilized and maximized. Relationships outside of the building with your customers and the aforementioned are just extraordinarily important. But relationships inside the building, in other words, inside the company, the relationships that 
myself and my senior management team have with our outstanding board of directors, the relationships that we have with each other, the fact that we can all sit down at the meeting and passionately disagree on any one topic, yet we walk out of the room united in a decision. That's a respectful relationship where you invite spirited conversations as long as the agenda is for the betterment of the organization. That's just the test of a good relationship. So leadership, maybe it's not all about relationships, but it's certainly half about relationships at least. Dennis Wilson of Delta Dental, I'm going to follow up on this. I wasn't joking at all when I, and, and if anyone ever met Dennis or actually, you could check Dennis out on an interview. Go on our website, Mary, tell mm -hmm. folks. They can actually see Dennis, not just listen to him right now. They could see him on the air with us. Yes, it's Steve Adubato. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O dot org. And mm -hmm. put Dennis's name in there and it'll yeah, pop up it'll a pop right bunch up. of interviews we've done over the years. But here's where I'm getting at. I mentioned what a nice, decent person you are for a reason, and it's this. You have to make very tough decisions. You have to tell people bad news. We were just talking to another CEO of a major accounting firm on a previous edition of the Leadership Hour about this, and I asked, how do you deliver really bad news? How do you tell someone that their performance is not what it needs to be? You're a nice person who has to deliver bad news. How do you do that? And is that hard for you, Dennis? It's never easy to tell someone, this is your last day. Let's face it, and those that find it easy, I kind of wonder about their own character. So it's always the toughest kind of conversations, particularly if you value relationships and you value professionalism and all that. However, you know, if you have a clear conscience about it, if you understand that the job that has to be done has to be done, and you're fair in rating someone's performance, if the metrics and levels of accountability are clear and understood, and if it's for the betterment of the organization, then you walk into a conversation like that with a clear mind and a clear conscience and you do what you have to do. Last question. Coaching and mentoring, where does that fit into your role as a leader of your organization? It is among the top functions and roles that any CEO plays. Look, the first day on the job, the CEO's job is to look around for their successor. No kidding. You are put there to lead the organization for a period of time. So the best thing that you can do for the organization as a CEO or as any senior manager is develop the bench strength, mentor those that have an affinity for mentorship, and develop the talent and bench strength that you have. Because in today's competitive market, look, we're 3 4% unemployment, depending on where you look. At any one point, I just saw this statistic yesterday, 30% of anyone's workforce is entertaining other options. So, <laughs> oh, wait, you know, that's terrifying. Well, hold, wait, hold on. Dennis, that's stay a on that. big number. We, we just lost one of our good people yeah. in our organization, and we're actually recruiting as we speak a new person, and which it's is a challenge, but it's a new opportunity. Dennis just opened up this huge Pandora's box. Dennis, is there anything you can do as a leader, as a CEO, to make sure, quote, we don't lose those people? We can't make sure. You don't really, right? You can never make sure. And quite frankly, if you have a great talent and you have a great person, you cannot hold them back if your organization does not offer the next step in their career. I mean, sometimes it's just legitimately the better offer, and you have to be prepared for that. That's why it's so important, critically vital, to develop that mid-level management to take bigger steps. Challenge them, you know, give them something that's totally out of their comfort zone. Tolerate and understand their mistakes and correct them with good guidance. And that creates organizational stickiness, if you will. That creates individuals that, that really want to stay with you, be part of the team, and advance their career within your own four walls. That's the best you can do. Well said. You've been listening to uh, Dennis Wilson, who's the president 
and Chief Executive Officer of Delta Dental New Jersey and Connecticut. This is the Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato, uh, with my colleague Mary Gamba. Dennis, listen, I, I want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us and offering valuable tips and tools about leadership communication management and everything connected to it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Dennis. Great job. This is the Leadership Hour. This is Steve Adubato. That's Mary. We'll be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Welcome back to the Leadership Hour. I'm Steve Adubato with uh, my colleague, Mary Gamba. You know what, Mary? It is so interesting. You know, we just listened to Dennis Wilson over at Delta Dental, who was absolutely terrific. And we are lucky enough to have gotten a guest that we had on a previous leadership hour. Uh, of course, our timing was a little bit off, so he was the great Frank Morano. He was and is the great Frank Morano from AM 970. He was running off to do his liquid lunch program yes. over on Newsmax live. And so in the middle of the interview, Frank's like, I got to go because we called him a little late. So we're lucky enough to have Frank back in the line. Frank Morano, are you there, buddy? I'm here, Steve. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. And by the way, let folks know again where you ran off to uh, live because we're doing this live to tape, which means we're acting as if we're live, but we're taping it. You were doing it live, live. That's right. So every weekday at noon, so in addition to the live radio show that I'm part of with Joe Piscopo every weekday from 6 to 10, every weekday at noon, uh, I am live on Newsmax with a really crazy character named John Tobacco, who's as witty as he is uh, wacky. And uh, we're, we're on every day live at noon with a show called Liquid Lunch that I'd love for people to check out and offer me their feedback on. You got it. And by the way, uh, Frank, let folks know how they can find you on Twitter. I am found on Twitter at Frank, M-O-R-A-N-O. -O. That's Frank, M-O-R-A-N-O. -O. And I'd love to hear from you in the non-tweeting community via email at Morano at NYCRadio.com. I love that you did that. By the way, Frank, when can folks catch... I swear we're not just going to plug. Um, for, to let folks know when and how people can listen to you as an on-air personality on AM 970 on Sunday morning, starting at? If anybody gets up with the rooster or suffers from insomnia, they can listen to me Sunday mornings from 4 a.m. to 8.30 on AM 970. Mary, why are you making okay. a face? That's fascinating. So, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. So, I was <laughs> <laughs> nice, Frank. Real nice. Why are you making a face, Mary? Oh, I just I can't believe it. I I guess I probably wouldn't go to bed. I think I would just stay up and then sleep after. I don't think unless what do you do? Go to bed at like six o'clock that night and then get up at one thirty. Uh, yeah. Frank, you I, don't, I don't know Frank. Frank. <laughs> uh, that is true. He has a show called Liquid Lunch. So, That's Frank, true. what's Saturday uh, night like for you? Come on. I, I, I you know, know that. It, it, Go ahead. It, it, Saturday night it, between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. is my fiance, who is an amazing person I'm lucky enough to live with her prodding me for two hours to stop working and go to sleep. Aww. So it, it becomes a battle to because, uh, as you know, Steve and Mary, you know, your show prep is really never done. You could no. keep preparing forever. Right. So mm -hmm. at some point you have to force yourself to stop reading, to stop going through articles, to stop editing audio, to stop looking up things, uh, to stop ex exploring creative uses of sound and force yourself to go to sleep because if you've only gotten two hours of sleep, it's going to be a much, much more sloppy show than if you've gotten five or six hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to give him some marital advice. If it's a fiance and I'm going on 20 years in my marriage, so congratulations to me. If we make it that far in a few weeks. Well, but... I'm going, I'm on my second marriage, uh, yeah. and which so far I'm hoping is my last. So after right, you give some- You can combine all your marriages combined, Steve. They don't add up to marry 20. Oh, I think that might no, be right. No, close. We're going to leave that alone. Yeah, Go we'll ahead. Leave that alone. Mary, Mary, you My, were saying, and while Frank interrupted say, you. Your wife is always right. So when she says that it's time to go to bed, you have to put down those notes. And as long as the, uh, the wife is always right, then you will have a long and happy marriage. Mary, I am learning that more and more every day. So Amen. thank you. But you Frank, you it. actually have. Uh, it's interesting on the leadership hour. I, I had like five things I wanted to talk to Frank about, but he just triggered something, which means we're going to shift gears. Great leaders are, as we like to say, strategically agile, which means they shift gears. So here's the thing, Frank. You are a perfectionist. You have a ridiculous, absurd amount of energy. 
I've been in the studio with you enough times in enough situations to know that you're always on the go. Here's the question. In your mind, what's the connection between being a great leader and having an absurd amount of energy and passion? Well, you know, I've asked the same question to so many leaders, and I see what you do, Steve, and I know your crazy workout regimen, and let me assure you, uh, when I'm getting up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, it's not to go on a rowing machine or a treadmill. Uh, me and neither. I, have a feel- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I actually can't see, I, but, but hold on a second. I actually can't see doing what we do if you didn't work out in the morning, but go ahead. You you get oh, it no, done, and Mary exactly does too. right. And, and I, I'd like to do uh, more of that because so many of the great leaders that I talk to that have your level of energy – all do that same thing. They have this incredible exercise regimen. But I think for me anyway, the key is to really have a passion for what it is that you're doing. Uh, Because if you're bored by the work that you're doing, then um, I I don't think there's any way to do it with the kind of enthusiasm and the kind of drive necessary to get the job done. So on that note, what's interesting to me is, Frank, you interview a fair number. Mary's actually interviewing people as we speak right now with some of our team because we're hiring a new team member or two new team members, right? So Frank hires interns. Frank has to bring people on. Frank, how hard is it for you as a leader? You're on air as a leader, but you're also Joe Piscopo's executive producer, right? You've been the executive producer of some other folks as well with, say, some strong personalities in the past. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for We're sure. just going to leave that alone. So uh, here's what's fascinating. When you see someone who doesn't have <clears throat> my grandmother, God rest her soul, from Naples, Italy, when she came to this country, when she met, I'm not going to say who she met, and she told me in Italian, she says, she's a mucha mush. What she <laughs> meant was that person, I was a woman I introduced my grandmother to, it was very important. She said she didn't have the energy. She didn't see the drive. She didn't see it. Frank, when you see someone who's mucha mush, who doesn't really have it, how hard is that for you to actually say, I want them on my team? Well, it's it's impossible to say you want them on your team. Now, like there's all sorts of circumstances that lead you to settle for people that you wouldn't necessarily have preferred to have on your team. And in those instances, as great leaders do, you try to adapt and make the best of those situations. But I think if you see someone that has no enthusiasm for the tasks that you're going to be working with them on on a daily basis, not only do you know that they're not going to be good at their job, but you know they're going to hurt you from, you know, achieving the performance that you need to achieve. So uh, I think to me, enthusiasm and a genuine passion for whatever the work you're doing, whether it's producing a radio show, running a political campaign, running a not-for-profit, anything, it's essential. It's not, it's not nice to have. It's absolutely essential. Yeah. And I know, by the way, before you jump in, Mary, I know Frank, Frank, am I wrong? Or as we're speaking about energy and passion, enthusiasm, are you actually on the move as you're speaking to us right now? I, I am. I am actually on my way to City Hall right now. I I'm, knew uh, it. I uh, knew he was moving. He's, wow. Oh, I know it. He's always going somewhere. I know his voice. He's moving on the move. Go ahead, Mary. I know. I. I well, it's funny because Frank can't see this, but I actually raise my hand like I'm in second grade because- Can I say we, something, please? Can I say something, please? It's my turn. And <laughs> and yes, we are interviewing, and I swear to both oh, of you- You told me about this woman. There was a woman, when I say, not only was she not energetic, I don't think she had a pulse, <laughs> and was falling asleep in the interview- leaning on her hand, dozing almost. And finally, after she left, I said to the rest of my coworkers, I said, I think she was doped. I think somebody roofied her drink before she came in for the interview. It, was, it wasn't It was even flat. There's no words to say. She seriously seemed like she was not interested. There was no spark. And it, it was just a waste of time. So, Frank, let's take what Mary was just saying. So, I, you know, this is so interesting. I always say it's not going to be political. Last time we started this conversation with Frank, he said that I always say I'm not going to say something political right before I'm about to say something Because he knows you well. Right. Yeah, it's almost like beginning a sentence with, this is not supposed to sound racist, but let me let me begin. Frank, that's that's the worst analogy or, I've ever or, heard. Or wait, I have another good Steveism, Frank, if we're on that uh, on that track. Go ahead. How about with all due respect? If he starts oh, yeah, a sentence yeah. with that, whatever comes immediately following, you might as well just throw everything out the window. So if you right, have to start a sentence with that, don't say whatever it is that's coming after that line. Welcome right, to the, the trash, the, the, the Steve Adubato <laughs> hour. Go ahead. Right. These are leadership right, perfect, skills, Steve. The, the perfect mid-sentence qualifier is having said that. That's the, <laughs> that's the other one. That's great. With that being said, Frank, yeah. with that being said, how's this? Uh, you lost my train of thought. Stop. 
Okay, I'm hold sure on, wait a minute. I, Trump bashing somehow. So no, no. <laughs> You're horrible, Frank, because here's where we're on with Frank Morano, the great Frank Morano, who can be heard every Sunday morning from 4 to 8.30 a.m. on AM 970 and as the executive producer of the great Joe Piscopo show from 6 to 10 and also on Liquid Lunch on uh, Newsmax every day at noon. So, but here's where I'm going with this, Frank. I said that personality, spark, energy, enthusiasm, passion, connecting with people on a human level is huge. I argued, and I really do mean forget about politics, that a big part of the reason that Hillary Clinton did not win the 2016 election is that everything we just talked about, in my opinion, even though I'm admitting I did vote for her reluctantly. Well, admitting you have a problem is the first step, Steve. But What? <laughs> Frank. I'm, listen, I'm saying she didn't have the thing that we're saying no, no, she needed. And if she had it, I don't think Donald Trump would be president. I, I tend to oh, look, as you know, um, having won and lost your fair share of elections, you know, in any election. Why do you have to bring so, that up? But go ahead. Well, sorry. There are so many different scenarios that you could point to if this had gone differently, if that had gone differently. In Hillary Clinton's case, uh, I think you're exactly right. Stay on uh, personality I, and leadership. Yeah, I think, well, one, um, if you contrast that to the charisma and the energy and the passion that her husband has and has uh, and to the energy that Barack Obama has, it's easy to see. And I would argue uh, uh, that Donald Trump has, if you'd ask any of his supporters, it's easy to see why these folks win and why Hillary didn't. And the interesting thing with Hillary is that people who have spent time with her on a one on one basis, they say that she does have that degree of charm, charisma, and passion on a, on a personal level, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't translate to the masses. Well, stay on that, Frank, because it's a fascinating leadership and communication question. What about if someone says, I'm really good one-on-one, -on -one, but get me in a large group? Oh, my God, that's not me. Can you be a great leader, in your opinion, Frank Morano, while you're moving very quickly towards City Hall to conduct you know, some sort funny. of business. I'm, I'm walking into into quiet buildings from, and I'm not announcing why I'm going in there. I'm just stepping into <laughs> quiet building after quiet building until someone looks like they're going to come over and ask me to leave, and then I leave and go to the next quiet building. I love but it. We're, we're, I, okay. <laughs> By the way, you notice every time we're on with Frank, yes, he's going somewhere, mm -hmm. doing something. So in the last minute, Frank, here, here's my question. Someone says, I'm good on one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not good in large groups. Can you be a great leader with that persona? You know what, Steve, you and your books have made pretty clear that there is no cookie cutter manner of leadership and no cookie cutter management style. So I think it is possible that if you cannot inspire tens of thousands, um, but you really can inspire individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis to do well, I think it's much tougher, uh, whether you're managing a boardroom or a baseball team, if you can only deal with people and connect with them on a one-on-one -on -one level, I think it's a much tougher road to hoe. Love it. By the way, before Frank Morano cuts us off, we're going to cut him oh, off. <laughs> nice. Gets to pull out that cane. Listen, um, Frank, you are a great producer, a great on-air personality, a great leader who lives it every day, and most importantly, just a really good person. Frank Morano, um, check him out every Sunday morning on AM 970 from 4 to 8.30 a.m. And also as the executive producer of the Joe Piscopo Show. By the way, real quick, uh, you're on with Al Gattulo and Debbie Duhame and Joe Piscopo. How much fun is that show before you let you go? Uh, you know what? I can't even tell you how much fun it is because if Jerry Crowley heard me, he would stop paying me. But it's basically like, and by the way, I don't get paid very much, but it's basically like getting paid <laughs> to hang out with your friends every day. And by the way, Jerry Crowley, talk about great leaders and bringing people together. He is the boss over at AM970. Hey, Frank, go to City Hall. Go deal with the uh, city, quote unquote, leaders in New York and take care of business, my friend. I am. I'll say hello to our next president, Bill de Blasio, on your behalf, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Take care. Hey, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Frank. You know, you're sitting there going, a lot of things you're thinking, but you, are you thinking in part, well, we have two minutes left in this, mm -hmm. um, are you thinking... How did Steve know that Frank was moving? I love that. And I, I loved, I have a visual of, and, and just because I know Frank as well, I have a visual of him running into like a store and then people looking at him like, what are you doing in here? But it's quiet and them shooing him out and then he runs oh, into the next store or office or whatever. In I'm just city saying. Hall. And like, he's always city got hall. some business in City Hall <laughs> running around. It's doing, great. It's great. Is, uh, and definitely... by the way, 
on the high energy thing, mm-hmm. again, I, I, you told me about this person. I don't want to yeah, perseverate and, and on it. Yeah, and you don't it. want somebody that's shot out of a cannon. You don't want no, somebody that's, that's, that, nerve-wracking. that's so annoying and it's like, take it down. It's a lot easier to tone someone's energy down if they're super, super high energy than it is to take somebody that is like a lump of clay and build them up and get them to be, to emote. Why is I always that a leadership that issue? It's a huge leadership issue because you don't want to give off the perception to others that you're bored, that you're disinterested. And if you do that as a leader, you can't do that as a leader, period. No one's going to follow you. No one's going to believe in you. And you need to show, even if you're tired, if you're if you're worried, you need to be- You're not feeling well. You're not feeling I was, well. I was cranky about this. How about I was telling you all week, I've got my allergies are, mm-hmm. are bad. I've got a cold because of the allergies. Yep. i got a sore throat. I'm congesting. And by the I way- I was so empathetic. No, I wasn't. By the way, Mary lacks- <laughs> I want to be clear on this. In the last minute, I, I want to officially state that Mary Gamba and my wife, yeah. Jen- totally lack the empathy gene it's horrible and What's it's not just with you with, the two with of you my and kids millions of others my my 14 year old wow was, what do we say wow 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 and and he skinned his knee really bad i mean it was it was a bloodbath joey he's 14 right first of all how do you skin your knee at 14 why don't you get your hands down first i'm just saying but and that's what of course what i say to him before i'm looking at it treating it whatever and it needs stitches it, it doesn't need stitches it didn't need stitches and you know put a band-aid on it and move on i don't have time energy so my yeah, empathy well, Joey did that, and our son Chris broke his hand on a door over the weekend, and um, I, I, my my wife was like, his bone was sticking out, and you could see it on his hand. And my wife was like, "Listen, I think you sprained it. Let's yeah, put uh, ice put, on it." <laughs> meanwhile, you go to the hospital; he had to get it set, and yeah, it's broken. Anyway, empathy and leadership—just one of the many topics we deal with on the Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba. I want to thank Frank Morano and also Dennis. Uh oh, Dennis Wilson, Dennis Wilson from Delta, Delta Dental. Dental. Boy, this was. This leadership hour went by so quickly. By the way, stay tuned for the second half, which is State of Affairs. Oh, State of Affairs. Absolutely. It'll be a great show. State of Affairs, talking about all things cool and interesting going on in the state. This is Steve Adubato. That's Mary. We'll check you out again next week on the Leadership Hour. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. This is Tracy Thompson, New Jersey's acting insurance fraud prosecutor. The state of New Jersey is making learning about and reporting insurance fraud easier than ever. At njinsurancefraud.org, you'll find tips on identifying insurance fraud and a simple, confidential form for reporting it. Report it, end it. Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At RWJ Barnabas Health, we believe that everyone needs to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, NJM Insurance Group, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community, Choose New Jersey, Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Promotional support provided by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. And by New Jersey Globe. State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio. It's our pleasure to welcome Jared Maples, director of the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Good to see you, Jared. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. You know, the, people, I'm sure people ask you all the time, how safe are we? Mm-hmm. Too broad a question. My question is, what are we doing to be as safe as the state needs to be? 
It's a, a great question and it's something we think about quite a bit. There's always threat out there and something we talk about frequently. We put out our annual threat assessment, for example, the report about all the threats that we see here at the state. Um, what we're doing about it is working in collaboration. One thing I can assure the people in New Jersey is we work tightly with FBI, Federal Homeland Security, the New Jersey State Police, and all of our local and county partners to counter the threat, to make them aware of what, to, mm -hmm. uh, what the threats are and then what they can do about it. An important initiative we operate is getting the community aware of those same things. So the See Something, Say Something campaign for example, in the terrorism world, some of the work we're doing with cybersecurity to make sure we're highlighting what those mm -hmm. threats are, and again, most importantly, what they can do about them. By the way, we're, as we're uh, talking to Jared Maples, who heads up Homeland Security in the state, the website will be up, and she talked about public awareness and information. It's part of what we are here for as well, so go on to that site to find out more. The uh, 2019 terrorism threat assessment, mm -hmm. when you rank them, help us on this. Sure. Uh, Anarchist extremists who are mobilized to around perceived injustice. You got ISIS. You got uh, militia extremists. You got uh, sovereign citizens who are anti-government groups who mainly target law enforcement. You got white supremacists. Is there a ranking there? So yeah, the rankings are done for for high, moderate, and low. Um, interesting part about our rankings are really two buckets or umbrellas of terrorism. There's international terrorism and domestic terrorism. We don't rank those. Um, we break them down by ideologies, which you're, we, we just listed. Um, so we break them down, for example, a high threat in New Jersey. The highest threat is homegrown violent extremists. Rahimi Saipov, who did the West Side Highway truck uh, ramming about a year and a half ago. Those are great examples of HVs and still something we see as a, a top tier HVs. threat. Homegrown violent extremists. That's the biggest threat? Uh, yep. And then, and then domestic, but remember, we break them down by ideology. So realistically, uh, all those threats, the international and domestic terrorism, are 1A and 1B. They're both high top level targets. The ideology is based off of threats based off of where we know geographically they are, mm. um, if, incidents that have happened in New Jersey, um, potential incidents that have, could happen in New Jersey. That's our methodology without getting too far into all the specific details of how we bake where the is, algorithm. Uh, Jerry, where does ISIS, yeah. quote unquote, fit into this? So it's interesting, um, HVs, or homegrown, homegrown violent extremists, are inspired by groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda, some of the major international terrorism organizations. We tier them as the lowest threat, the actual ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda core elements. Lowest. We do. Um, so they're, what, when they do an operation, for example, Al-Qaeda's signature um, attack was 9-11, right? right. Um, there's a lot of uh, key indicators and flags for the behaviors, um, directives from emanating from the leadership, uh, Zawahiri in this case, he used to be bin Laden, obviously. Um, there's a lot of different financial transactions that happen, logistics, quite frankly. And those are areas that the federal government in particular, but so too we at the state level, have really um, honed our approach at, at intercepting and, and heading off. So the home going around the extremists, the people are inspired by, but not mm -hmm. directed by, become a top tier threat for us. Talk about cybersecurity. Yep. So we're responsible for cybersecurity What's in the state. Threat? Uh, the threat is, is evolving and persistent. It is every single day. A great example in New Jersey is in municipal governments. We've seen a huge uprise in what's called ransomware attacks. Um, so a, it can be, again, a, a police office, a, a school, uh, an authority, a water authority, or something like that have been attacked. Um, they get in through spear phishing or phishing a lot of times where they'll send an email that's in, you know, encoded or encrypted with, with bad malware, they call it, um, which gets into the system itself. They take over the system and they hold it hostage, just like a kidnapping case, um, a regular traditional kidnapping, which in this case it's online. And by the way, give some folks, uh, as the website goes up again, <clears throat> Jared, you, you hear people say, I got this email from the IRS, mm -hmm. the FBI, I saw the logo, I got to do something. Yep. You say? So a lot of times, uh, well, number one is we put all the information out there about those threats on our website, again, at njhomelandsecurity.gov, right or we also have cyber.nj.gov, which say is again. the cyber, cyber.nj.gov. That'll direct connect to the NJ Kick, which is the New Jersey Communications and Cyber Integration Cell. Um, we're the first state in the United States to have something like that, which is analysis, threat sharing, threat information, and then mitigation techniques to get out of it when it happens. So they're engaged in all those incidents I talked about. What is this one on cybersecurity? Girls Go Cyber Start is what? Yep, so that's a great effort. That, that's a national level effort that we've tied into. Um, I'm proud to say we're leading it um, across the United States. But Girls Go Cyber Start is a, a way to invigorate uh, young women to get involved in STEM and more importantly and more specifically into cyber 
um, uh, cyber activities. So it's a competition. They're welcome to come and, and they work through encryption codes and try to solve them. You don't have to have a computer background mm -hmm. to, to do it, um, but it's just a great way to earn some money, scholarship money, for example, and, and uh, get young women involved and interested in cyber. Uh, final question. Um, we're very much involved in a series on the future of innovation. Yeah. Yeah. How much of what you and your colleagues do every day is tied to quote unquote, not just the future of innovation, yep. but innovation today? Um, quite a bit. We're almost a startup lab. We try and, and t try to focus and innovate as within the Homeland agency? Security. Yeah, is that, is that crazy? <laughs> Explain so, that. As, a, as an innovation side. So we're constantly trying to find new ways to get at old problems and new problems. We're trying to get ahead of those. And sometimes it's through cyber. Of course, that's the easy nexus with technology. But also in counterterrorism, we're doing new things every single day to try to reimagine how we prevent, uh, defend and protect New Jersey. Just not looking at it the same way, and that's the innovative part? Uh, that's the innovative part, yep. And, and we're, we're trying. And if something doesn't work, we readdress it, try to fill those gaps and fix it. Um, and that's a little different approach. Cyber is a great example of it, something we're doing that is out on the kind of the edge of the United States, quite frankly, um, but really looking at what we can do to innovate and make mm -hmm. that better and, and get ahead of the threat. We know that there's hackers. How do we get ahead of it in a year or two? Jared Maples is the director of the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Thank you and your colleagues for what you do every day to work to protect us. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs, and we will be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by Dr. Denise Rogers, who's Vice Chancellor at Rutgers University in the area of? Interprofessional programs. You're also one of the smartest, most impactful physician leaders that, that I've ever spoken to, particularly on the subject of what is being called trauma-informed care. Talk about it, doctor. Thank you. So we have increasingly learned over the last 20 plus years the impact of trauma on child development and subsequently on the health of adults. And we're now increasingly interested then in understanding less of what's wrong with you and more of what has happened to you. For example? So for example, we know that adults who in childhood experience six or more adverse events will have a life expectancy that's 20 years less than the average life expectancy. Okay, adverse childhood experiences, otherwise known as ACEs. Otherwise known okay. as ACEs. <clears throat> and By the way, excuse me, check out NJTV, side will be up. Uh, our good friend Michael Hill, who we just, we had a conversation with him, did a five-part series on this topic. Check it out, I'm sorry. Yes. And so, um, one of the things that we know about ACEs that include things like physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, having a parent with a mental illness, having a parent with a substance use disorder, having an incarcerated parent, having parents who've had very difficult divorce. Children who are exposed to these things then have difficulty often as they're growing up with emotional regulation, sometimes with learning, mm -hmm. because they grow up in this heightened sense of stress. They never know what's coming next. And because of the physiologic effects on children, as they get older, oftentimes they'll self-medicate. So they smoke, or they drink, or they may use drugs, or they may eat. Mm -hmm. And what that leads to then are increased rates of heart disease, cancer, but also we see higher rates of suicide, higher rates of depression, substance use, that sort of thing. Along, this, along these lines, doctor, and we'll put up the, our right from the start, NJ, we have an ongoing uh, initiative where we're trying to deal with uh, the needs of infants and toddlers, mm -hmm. okay, and mm -hmm. those who care for them. Mm -hmm. These adverse childhood experiences, do they, can they in fact happen from zero to three? Absolutely, they can happen from zero to three. Imagine it. I mean, that first several years are the periods when it's most critical for, for children to be nurtured by their parents. If they're neglected, if they're not cuddled and talked to and held, that has a psychological and physiological adverse effect on these children. Absolutely, this, this, can, this adversity can occur from birth. Dr. Rogers, what do we, by the way, we're speaking to Dr. Denise Rogers, uh, Vice Chancellor at Rutgers University. Um, what do we need to do from a public policy point of view? I mean, State of Affairs focuses less on politics, more on policy. What do we need to do? We need to have a two-pronged approach. 
The first prong is we need to try to prevent children from experiencing adversity as much can as we? we can. Absolutely we can. We can do it through education, education of parents. We can do it through education of teachers and the systems that children interact with so that when children are acting out, particularly traumatized children, mm -hmm. rather than necessarily taking a punitive approach and further traumatizing them, we can actually be more nurturing of them. We can help them to learn to emotionally self-regulate rather than moving toward spanking, for example, which just further traumatizes the children. But the second part of our approach has got to be dealing with the adults. So we have to create services for adults who've had adversity in their lives so that they can become healed, if you will. You know what's interesting to me about this? Um, there are some who, when they've heard this whole concept of uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, they'll say, look, who hasn't had a mm -hmm. tough childhood? And the numbers are, are astronomical in mm -hmm. terms of out of every 10. Uh, well, put it this way, I think there are, uh, I think there are 10 indicators that we look for and a high percentage of people have had five or more. That's right. So people say, oh, many of us watching right now, some may say, well, come on, just get tough, tough it out. Right. It's not that simple. Toughing it out doesn't work. The, the other thing is, so the numbers look like this. We probably, about 30 to 40 percent of kids have experienced one adverse childhood experience, right? So the numbers get smaller. I mean, we really don't have as many children experiencing multiple adversities, because these are pretty serious adversities we're talking about. Let me interrupt you. We're, yeah. right, we're in Newark right now. Yeah. Eight-year-old child. Right. And our daughter happens to be eight. That's why the number right. hit me. Right. Eight-year-old little boy or little girl. Yeah. Central Ward, South Ward of Newark. Right. West Ward of Newark. Yeah. He or she could be facing what as it relates to this that is just traumatizing on so many levels. Well, you're, you're raising two very interesting and important points, Steve. The first is... ACEs are disproportionately affecting children of color. So about 50% of Hispanic kids and 60% of black kids have one or more ACE. And white okay? kids? White kids, about 40%. Okay. Asian kids, about 25%. Okay. The second thing, though, is the American Academy of Pediatrics has clearly declared poverty in and of itself is an adverse experience. So just out of the box, no matter what's going on in the home, if a child is living in a community that's affected by poverty, they're having that one ACE. Very often, think about the incarceration rates that we see, right? Think about the rates of substance use that we see in the community. So it's very easy for these kids in inner city Newark to be experiencing multiple ACEs wow. and experiencing the, then the adverse effects of them. Real quick on this. Uh, actually, I first heard you speak about this at a, um, at a Newark Community Advisory Board Forum that we mm -hmm. had at, at Newark Beth Israel Medical Center. And one of the things that strikes me is that the, the topic of um, social determinants of health come up, comes right. up a lot. Right. Could you, in layperson's language, Dr. Right. Rogers, which you're so good at doing, explain what that means and why it's relevant to this larger discussion? Right. So social determinants of health are really those things outside of the medical system. They're like, what community do you live in? What kind of job do you have or not? What is the uh, availability of fresh fruits and vegetables in your community. How about transportation right? or lack thereof? Exactly. Can't get there. You, that's exactly right. These are the things. And what have we discovered? We've discovered that these social determinants are more impactful on a person's health outcomes than what I do as a physician in the office. But hold on. We look to physicians right. to heal us. And you are saying? That's right. I am saying that if we don't find a better way to heal our communities and our families and our social structures, we will not be successful in healing individuals to the extent to which we need to. Final question. While more awareness is uh, important, and that's what we are uh, about here, are there any policy changes, or at least one that you can mention, that would not fix but help? Yes. So um, the mayor of Newark has included in his policies moving forward to have Newark eventually become a trauma-informed city. A trauma informed city, real quick on that. That means? That means that we're going to train police officers and school teachers and those working in social services agencies about trauma so that they're better able to deal with their clientele who've been traumatized, but also they're better able to deal with our own trauma. So it's interesting. You've got several healthcare organizations here, but you're saying everyone else needs to be involved in this. Absolutely. Dr. Denise Rogers is vice chancellor at Rutgers University. Um, working every day, not just to help and heal people, but to talk about the important public policy issues beyond just what physicians do, but all of our responsibilities. As always, I learned from you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.
This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to welcome State Assemblyman Andrew Zwicker, who is a Democrat. He's also the uh, chair of the Science, Innovation, and Technology Committee in the uh, State Assembly. New committee. Brand new committee last year. Speaker Craig Coughlin created it as an understanding as a center point for the fact that innovation, science, technology is an economic driver and is so much of what's in our lives today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're about a year, a little more than a year in, and it's been an excellent, excellent experience so far. Two things. One, this is yeah. part of an ongoing conversation we're having on the future of innovation in the state, but also you are maybe the only person who happens to be a physicist, right. who happened to be at Princeton right. University, to ever serve in the legislature? First and only physicist ever serve in the legislature, hopefully not the last. Uh, why is that, help us understand how that helps you be the chair of this committee. So one is, of course, a background in science. But I think that the other piece of this, besides the background, is that the difference between science and politics is, I think, a wonderful mixed up thing. Politics makes me a better scientist. I think a scientist, being a scientist, makes me a better politician, better policy maker. A scientist is a problem solver, trying to break down complicated problems into small bits that we can handle. And you got to start there. And science is evidence driven. And again, you got to start there. Politics, as we know, is about people and emotions and lots of pieces that go into a political decision. Mm. But if you start with a common set of evidence and data, then I think you can find compromise across the political aisle, across the political spectrum. I think it's the right way we want to mm. make public policy. Someone help us on this. The governor uh, has talked about the, the innovation economy. How do you see what that is in the state and, and what right. it could actually mean to the economy of the state in terms of jobs and economic right. development, tax revenue, et cetera? You start by looking backwards in time. New Jersey has been an innovation. Innovation starts by looking backwards. You start by looking backwards and see that innovation, you want to go back to Edison, you can go before Edison, has created an amazing discoveries that have changed how we live. Right? We could talk about the light bulb, the record player, color TV invented in New Jersey, the transistor invented in New Jersey. And not just invented, but creating jobs that you're talking about. And so you take that as your historical background and you look at other states or you look at the federal government and you see that when we invest in innovation, it makes people's lives better, it creates jobs. And so if you look at New Jersey and how are we going to create a growing economy, and there's a recent report out that showed in 2018 that our job growth has stagnated. And if you say, we're in New Jersey, what do we do well? Where do we have the greatest uh, chance for growth? It's in innovation. Describe it, though. Give us a couple of examples of where you see, Assemblyman, the opportunities for innovation turning into strong, powerful economic activity. Right. We already do it around life sciences. Uh, we have some of the largest, most creative life sciences companies trying to create a cure for cancer, do something about aging, whatever it might be. They already exist here in New Jersey. And the question is, for instance, using that as an example, is there a student right now or an inventor, an entrepreneur in a laboratory somewhere who's got the next great in invention? How do we make sure that this ecosystem is there so that they have a chance to find not just the capital that they need, but the uh, structure, the places, the laboratories, and the people and the workforce mm. so that their great idea can come out of their laboratory and into the workplace? So you have said that New Jersey in some ways, there's different hubs, mm -hmm. right? And those hubs are in somewhat broken, somewhat broken down by geography. Help me if I get this right. North Jersey is more focused, and the potential for innovation is more on the financial, on financial technology. Well, I look at it as if you look at our state, then you say North Jersey right across from the financial capital of the world. So financial technology, cybersecurity, for instance, things that are important to us, whether you are working in the financial industry or you're just online. The center of our state is where much of our life sciences and healthcare work is happening. 
The southern part of the state is known for aviation and agriculture. And out by the shore, we've got both wind and solar, so renewable energy. We also have things like autonomous vehicles and the next generation of mm -hmm. transportation. What's the job of a state legislative committee, right. which usually has oversight and regulatory responsibilities, for helping to fuel and drive those hub opportunities right. around innovation. So what other states have shown and what this committee is working on is when we directly invest into these startup companies along with and partnership with the private sector, then it's a win-win all around and we accelerate this economic growth. We accelerate the number of jobs that are there. So what we do as a committee is we have to put into place public policy proposals that will accelerate the job creation, mm. that will spur our entire economy. You know, what's interesting is um, you, you've got some folks, some in the business community who say, yeah, I'm all for innovation. I believe in the innovation economy. But they often will say that our tax policies and the fact that New Jersey is such a high tax state mitigate against those opportunities, fight against those opportunities, you say? I, I say a couple of things. One is, you know, we're under enormous financial pressure. And so there's always this question of where do we get the resources we need to pay for the things that we owe, our bills, for our fine public education system, um, for, for the things that drive our government and, and New Jersey Transit, et cetera. The, the piece of it then is what can we do to create jobs that create the economic incentives that create mm -hmm. the revenue that we need that start to help us relieve that enormous burden that we see the, the private sector being mm -hmm. so concerned about. One more quick question. Yeah. It's not really so much of a, an economic question, but more, more of a, let's put cybersecurity yeah. in context. The role of the legislative committee that you chair as it relates to cyber cybersecurity and protection of people's privacy, how do you deal with that? We've, looked at a series of bills to make New Jersey really one of the state leaders when it comes to the fact that when you're online, when you're shopping, whether you're writing an email to a friend or a family member or a work colleague, <clears throat> whether you are downloading uh, to look at a movie, stream a movie. Well, if I'm Facebook and I'm posting something about right. my kid and all of a sudden somebody's got my information to right. do what with it? Right. And that's the, not what I signed up for, or did I sign up for it and not even and, know it? And that's exactly the point, Steve, is that you need to have control of your data, what happens to it. If you want to choose to share it, your choice. But how do I make that choice if Facebook, I, I don't want to listen, right. this isn't about Facebook right. exclusively. It's about a lot of entities, just that I'm more aware of Facebook. Right. Are they supposed to say, time out, Steve, before we go any further, here are some questions we want to ask you and not in some sort of legalese that I can't understand. Exactly. So we have proposals in place that say, hey, you're going to sign up for Facebook or you're going to go on online for whatever reason, right? We're not going to pick on them. Could be Twitter, yeah. could be Instagram, could be whatever. It could be Uber. It could right. be, it doesn't, right. does not matter, right? Don't give my information out unless you ask unless, me. And they ask you in a way that you understand and you say, I'm good with that, then they're fine. If that is not, state by state though, Assemblyman? If we could do it at the federal level, and that's what we hear from these companies, that sure, should we have a national policy? We could. But without getting into why that's never going to happen. Go ahead. Yeah. If it can't happen in Congress, then we're going to make sure it happens in New Jersey and we protect the people of New Jersey. Some of them, we are glad that there is a, a physicist in the state legislature. We're glad it's you. And we appreciate you taking the Thank time you. to talk to us about innovation. Thanks, All Steve. The best. Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks for having Stay me. Stay right there. This is uh, State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll catch you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, NJM Insurance Group, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Choose New Jersey, and by NJIT. Every year, thousands of senior citizens are abused, neglected, or taken advantage of financially. Elder abuse can happen in many places, and seniors may not recognize they are being abused or may not feel comfortable coming forward. 
Raising the level of awareness of elder abuse is key to protecting our seniors, so understanding the warning signs of abuse is important. Be aware of changes in daily patterns, finances, and changes in appearance. If you think someone is being abused, please contact your local Adult Protective Services Unit or local authorities to get help right away. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life.